All right, so we're on part, what did I say? H, O, element of J, P, K. H, there we go. Overfishing, turn to page 302 in your book. We got a, uh, a little bit of notes to go through today, and then we got a couple videos we're going to watch. And um, I think we finished most of the short ones yesterday, except the one on malaria. Um, so we got to go back and hit that malaria and DDT usage. No, no, no. We watched the one on uh, the cats in Borneo, but we didn't watch the uh, one on humans getting sprayed down with malaria, right? I don't think so. No, no, no. So, we're going to go check that out, and we'll talk about it and discuss it and add some stuff in our notes because we haven't talked a lot about DDT, although it's probably the, the most important and most likely to see a pesticide on the test. Um, on page 302 in your book, part H in your notes, impact of overfishing. A term that I want you to know, if you don't already know, and so you can write this in, is called subsidies. What are subsidies? Money from the government. Money from the government, yes, for... To keep stuff going, basically, um, for instance, our farmers, so most of the farmers in the U.S. are large-scale farmers, and, hey, Andrew, can you close that door, please? They get subsidies from the government to help kind of buffer against what? Um, yeah, when there's drought, when there's flooding, so loss of crops so that they don't go out of business. You've got farmers who have 500, 1,000, 1,500 acres, um, they're working constantly throughout the year on their fields and stuff, and they've got half a million dollar combines and machines that they've got. And so if you have a really bad year where there's a big drought or even worse, probably a big flood, um, and it ruins your crop, then you, you don't want to go out of business. The government doesn't want you to stop producing food. Um, and so in order to keep people in the business and make sure things are going well, they will subsidize them. In fishing, the um, speaking of overfishing, um, the cod fishery off the coast of New England and the Grand Banks of uh, like Western Canada, they basically ruined the cod fishery there from sometime in the 1800s through the, I think, 1972. They thought there was an inexhaustible supply of codfish. And they kept fishing, and they kept getting more and more, and bigger ships, and they'd get more, basically fishing 12 months a year, getting as much as they could. And some ignorant moron thought they're just going to magically grow, and we couldn't get rid of them if we wanted to. And pretty much what they did is systemically get rid of all of the, I won't say all of them, but most of the codfish um, in that area. There were people coming over from Europe, the Russians, you know who you are watching me on YouTube. Um, and so they were coming over and fishing, some other people from uh, Northern Europe, and um, basically decimated the population. And one of the issues was the government in Canada was subsidizing fishers, or fishermen or women to go out and fish, making sure they had enough money and were going out every year because they wanted to, the people to have as much fish as they could. Um, and so they were kind of adding to it, and basically what it was doing was causing an increase, a just continued increase in the fish harvest. Fish that got harvested, they were spending more time out there, there was less fish, and the fish were? The fish they were catching was smaller um, because they weren't allowing them to grow as big. Yeah, and so you, you had this huge problem um, with over-harvesting the fish. And basically, it caused a fishery collapse, um, which is not a good thing, okay? So, on the left side of page 302 here, second paragraph, read that one for us. Rachel? In 2003, the Journal of Nature reported a dramatic decline in the number of large predatory ocean fish caught over the past 50 years, even though both the number of fishing vessels and the amount of time spent fishing had increased over that period. Fishers are working harder, but catching fewer fish. A study in 2006 found that 30% of fisheries worldwide had experienced a 90% decline in fish populations. The decline of fish population by 90% or more is referred to as a fishery collapse. What's one of the biggest issues when, how do you, okay, well, how do you prevent a overfishing? You limit uh, competition for 
laws, regulations that either limit or stop fishing or limit it to certain seasons. Um, how do you limit how much you catch? Like how, how do you decide how many fish you can go catch as a commercial fisherman, Colby? How does the government do that? What's the difficulty in that? I mean, how many fish are in? It's, it's very difficult to get a good accurate count of how many fish are in the sea. Um, and so that's one problem. R really what you want to do when you're trying to, I mean, what we're talking about sustainability here. So you're, you're sustaining a, a population of fish that you want to continually catch for years and years into the future, right? So um, you want to be able to take out a certain amount of the population, but the next year that population to be back where it was. So you've got to find that kind of sweet spot where you can maximize your the fish that you can take out, but you've also, um, that there there's enough left over where they can reproduce and you can have more fish for the next year. And that's hard to do when you don't know exactly how many fish there are. So when you start catching less fish, it's taking you more time, you're catching less fish and they're smaller, then you're doing something wrong. Um, and that should be a red flag. Another issue you've got, and so I watched a bunch of documentaries trying to find a good one to, to post on Schoology. Um, yesterday was, uh, I kind of, I didn't find any great ones, but I ran a couple across a couple and they were talking about um, the Chinese specifically. You know who you are online. Um, watching my videos. So they are really bad about subsidizing their fishermen. Um, they're basically paying their fishermen to go out and fish, even though they're not hardly catching anything and they're catching smaller and smaller stuff. So, and what you're doing there is you're not ever allowing the population to rebound. And so you're just taking more and more and more. And so the Chinese, what they're doing is they're spreading out. They've got these, there's a name for it, like super vessels. I don't know if it's in here, um, where like they can catch huge amounts of fish on these very large ships um, with, they have a lot of technology. One place where they were going is these Chinese ships were going all the way over the coast of Western Africa kind of where it makes the little bend in Africa on the left side. And they were overfishing those areas. Um, and so basically they're going to different fisheries around the world and they're kind of exploiting these different locations and bringing that fish back to, back to China. Um, and so people that fish in those areas, that may be their, you know, they may be small fishermen and that's their only source of income. They may be, what's the term for hunters or fishermen or women? that only hunt and fish for food for their family. What do you call them? Um, what? Yielding. Starts with an S. Stay Close. Yeah. Subsistence. Y'all need to know that term. So subsistence hunters or subsistence fishermen, these are people who live in locations and they hunt and they fish just to provide food for their family. Now, you can deplete resources if you have too many people doing that. But most of the time, subsistence hunters aren't the ones causing the problems that result in depletion of populations. For example, in Northern Alaska and Canada, there are still native populations up there like Inuit and I don't know who else, what, you, what they're called. But they still get permits to kill like so many polar bears. They, because they kill them and they eat them and they use the stuff. They get permits for so many seals, so many whales. So these are things that they have killed for hundreds of years or more to provide food and nourishment and to take care of their families. And so they still are able to do this and basically the population is maintained. Um, and so it's just when you have other individuals that are coming in that haven't normally been there or you have people who are doing it and they're selling it, and they're taking massive amounts, you can significantly reduce the population of really anything on earth. So that's something we have to guard against. All right, you need to know another term here on 302, bycatch. Bycatch would be analogous to what other thing we talked about in terms of sustainability. Non Very good, Colby. Non-target organisms. So we talked about when you're spraying pesticides and you kill something that you didn't mean to kill, like yesterday in the uh, cats video, 
They sprayed DDT to kill the mosquitoes, but accidentally they killed what What else? The cats. Um, the wasps. Wasp. And the wasp couldn't eat the caterpillars. The caterpillars ate the roofs. The gecko started eating them. And then there was another cascade of events. But, but basically the non-target organisms that were killed caused that cascade of problems. It wasn't really getting rid of the mosquitoes. I mean, I mean, I hate mosquitoes as much as the next guy, to be honest with you. I, I don't know if there's a significant impact if we remove mosquitoes from the food chain. Um, but we just have to be careful if we're going to remove mosquitoes that we don't get other stuff that we don't mean to. And then that causes other problems. I mean, I think probably... To be honest, getting rid of mosquitoes is not a bad thing because you've got so many people who die from mosquito-borne illnesses. You just have to be careful about, you know, what other organisms that, that you get rid of. Is there a way to go in and just kill mosquitoes? So that's one thing we'll get into in the video later on today. Um, so subsistence farmers, subsistence fishermen, these are people who are just getting what they need. Yeah, Andrew? Didn't they kill all the mosquitoes? They went through and tried to kill a bunch of them because it, there was a lot of malaria going around, a lot of people dying, yeah. So they were very, they would put, they kind of identified the problem about like draining areas that were holding water. Um, they were, I'm sure, putting some kind of chemical, I don't know what they used then, um, I don't know if DDT was around then, um, to kill mosquitoes in pools and stuff. But they, they dramatically reduced that because not only like you got dinghy fever, yellow fever, Zika, you got a West Nile, you got a ton of other mosquito-borne illnesses um, that are transmitted from, from person to person. So that's a that's a problem we have to look out for. Yeah? Um, didn't they also, um, for fishing, didn't they also, for certain species, they, didn't they also regulate for only like specifically catching males and trying not to catch the females? Um... That may be with specific species. I don't know about, I don't know that we have any fishing regulations where you can just catch a male or a female um, fish. I don't think there's any. Now, there are Donovan like slot limits. I don't know if y'all heard, does anybody know what that is? It's a slot limit for fishing. Andrew, what is it? It's like you can only catch a certain amount. Nope. That's the krill limit. Krill is how many you can have like in your, on you. Slot limit means like, some fish like at a certain range, like let's say from 20 to 24 inches, maybe those fish are like in their prime and they are producing lots of babies. And so they wanna leave as many of those baby producing fish as they can. But they also wanna allow people to catch fish for recreation. So you can catch fish smaller than that if you want to, you can catch fish larger than that if you want to, but you're at least leaving some that, are, that you know are gonna be reproducing, okay? Um, and then sometimes they do it the other way. I don't know how exactly they go about doing this. Sometimes it may be like you have to catch it within a certain range where they're big, but you're not catching the real big ones and you're leaving the small ones. So um, I don't, I'm sure they're, whatever they're trying to do, they're trying to maximize our recreation and food sources, but they're also trying to make sure that they're sustaining those um, animals in the wild. Sorry if I'm boring you, Rachel. All right. Next thing, on the left side here, how many of y'all have seen Finding Nemo? Me. All of you. If you're not, something's wrong with you. All right. Um, psh, remember in Nemo at the end where they're like swim down, swim down, they're trying to get away? Mm -hmm. So they were in these one of these big nets called a purse seine net, this huge net um, that they use. And if you look about on the left side of 302 there, purse seine nets. These nets can capture up to 3,000 adult tuna. Tuna is a big fish at a time. Almost a million pounds of fish at once. I mean, like, how many times do you have to do that in order to deplete the a large reproductive portion of the population? Not many. It wouldn't seem like, right? And then you come back to this statement where um, uh, Rachel read here on, on fishery collapse. Once you get down to that estimated like 90% range, you're talking about you've reduced the population so much where it's very difficult for it to recover. Um, like the cod fisheries in New England, they, they basically just had to say, we're gonna stop fishing in 1972 because the fishery just, the bottom dropped out. And, and so it still hasn't recovered to this day. 
And so they, they've, the only people that can fish for cod now are people recreationally can go out and catch a couple or whatever. But I'm talking about there were hundreds of sh large ships that were going out with these purse nets getting fish year round. That's how many fish there were and it still hasn't recovered. So it's so important to really understand the ecosystem and, and how the impact impact it has when you when you pull out that many fish. Colby? Oh, I was just asking like, if, if it recovered earlier. Now, they had a similar problem in Northern Europe off the coast of Northern Scandinavia where they almost completely depleted it. But a few years ahead of time, somebody had the guts to say, hey, we gotta stop. And so people, the problem is you're putting a ton of people out of work. They've got money invested in boats and stuff and homes and they live in these areas. And basically you're saying, okay, you're gonna have to stop what you're doing. You're not gonna be able to feed your families. So the governments, I think in, in both those instances were able to give some money and help and maybe help them to move somewhere else where they maybe could find a job. But it's really just like you're having to, like you've done this all your life. You've got to stop. You've got to do something totally different. And you and your family might not have enough food to get by. So it's a difficult decision. Yeah. All right, let's see. Over, impact of overfishing leads to scarcity of fish, loss of biodiversity in aquatic systems. So if you're taking fish out that are in like the middle of the food chain, what's going to happen to the organisms that are smaller than them? Okay, the population's gonna increase, okay? There's no telling how that's gonna affect other organisms under them. Um, what about things that eat those fish that are kind of in the middle? They'll decrease because they lose their food source. So it's like one of those, when you take one large um, animal, or, or not, not large, an animal that there's a lot of out of a system like that, you continually fish it, then you're completely disrupting the food chain. It's like cutting one of those big like strands on a spider web and it like folds in on itself. So you're creating a huge problem and you really don't know the ripple effect of that problem. Um, another example of fisheries, so like I talked about the Chinese. One, th I mean like one thing that you guys have to consider as you get older and what you consume, I know we talked about the other day about is anybody vegan or vegetarian or um, we also, we have to make these ethical decisions. Like, are we gonna eat something? If we're not, you know, why are we not gonna eat it? Are we okay with, you know, eating a chimpanzee or an elephant or a dolphin? Something that we would consider to be almost as intelligent as um, humans or maybe smarter than some, judging from some of the things going on lately. Um, and so are we okay with eating animals that we consider to be very intelligent like that? Um, what animals are we willing to eat? What animals are we willing to, I mean, cause you're gonna have to kill an animal to eat it. Like, you know, and, and then what are your ethics behind? Like, what are you okay with them? How are you okay with them being raised? How are you okay with them being slaughtered? These are all things to consider. We're going to watch a little bit of the cove today, um, or an excerpt from the cove. And they're going to talk about the dolphin slaughter in Japan. And so, you know, another example is most of us don't have a problem with eating fish. I mean, we all think of fish as, I don't know, pretty stupid. And I guess maybe that makes them easier to eat. Um, but let's say, what about the practice in Japan, in um, China of, and I'm sure they do it elsewhere, but in China, no, they do the, uh, the dolphin fin soup. Has anybody seen this? What do they do, Jeremiah? Yeah, not dolphins. Uh, does I say dolphin? Uh, shark fin, sorry. Yeah, Layla. They, they don't kill the shark. They cut the fin off and let them go. Yeah, so basically they'll pull these sharks up out of the water. They cut their fins off that they're going to use to eat. And then while they're still alive, they throw them back in the water. Um, remember, most of their fins made of like cartilage, kind of like our ears and noses and stuff. And so like they're back in the water. They can't swim now that they their fins are gone. And then they're just kind of sinking and they're gonna die this like horrible existence. I mean, just like go ahead and kill them, what's going on? And then another thing is you're wasting a huge portion of the animal. I don't know why like they don't eat the rest of it or what the deal is, but um, it's, I guess the shark fins are so valuable, like that's just what they continually are looking for. Um, and it just seems so inhumane for most of us to kind of view that. Um, you know, what about, 
if you're talking about your hierarchy of animals to kill, um, I don't know, chickens are probably up there kind of with fish. Most people eat chicken. Uh, I'm, I'm, I imagine if most of y'all had to kill an animal to eat it and survive, chicken would probably be high on the list. Um, it's a little bit harder to kill a pig. Although growing up on a pig farm, I would have no problem killing a pig just because of my unaffectionate nature for them. Uh, although we didn't kill pigs growing up. We just sold them for to the slaughterhouse or where they would feed them out. Um, but I've killed pigs out in the national forest. And, you know, if you're like me, Colby, you go out hunting the national forest, pigs are invasive out there. So, I mean, I feel like if nothing else, I'm doing everybody a favor by killing pigs out in the forest <laughs> because they're destroying the ecosystem out there and they're having this significant impact on um, other animals. And then you talk about, well, oh, we didn't watch Food, Inc., but in Food, Inc., I think the thing now to kill pigs is they electrocute most of them, looks like. They had one of these slaughterhouses. Yes. It, no, it, they run them into a pen, like a metal pen, and then they have all these little, um, like, you know, stand back high voltage things around it. So they run them in, they close it. I guess it's insulated around it. And then they run like a really high voltage charge. So it just kills them pretty much instantaneously, I would think. And then th they don't show you that, but you can see them running into the pen. They have the high voltage pen. And then when they come out the next side they're all just laying there on the ground um and then i mean it's just in a big electrical you're not you're not frying them in the sense of like cooking the meat or anything what do you why would it be unhealthy i don't know just thinking about eating a pig that just got charged <laughs> how would you like to go about doing it cows i think the the thing still is kind of they have like a knocker which means they have like this air gun with a bolt that shoots out of it really fast with a, it's like it's hooked up to an air pump. And so um, I think what they do is they just hold it up their heads and they, that bolt shoots out and it kills them pretty much instantaneously. Yeah. That's how they killed the lambs and pigs. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, I mean, for a while, that's what they were doing most bigger animals with. And I don't know why they've, I guess the pigs, it's probably easier than having to go through one at a time when you can do a bunch of them. Um, but I think that's what they're still using for cows. Yeah. Why do they, why don't they just do like the same method for all of them? Well, I mean, if you've got like 20 pigs, then it's a lot easier just to electrocute them all at once and then run them through to the slaughterhouse and break them down than it is to have to go through and knock them one at a time. Cause they're coming through, they're getting in a, in a small pen and you've got to get that up against them. Logistically, it'd just be more difficult. Um, I don't know why they don't do that to cows. Maybe all the poop or whatever who knows i don't know <laughs> maybe it's just easier to do it they're doing it whatever the quickest most efficient way is at the most slaughterhouses um and then they go through the process of basically you've got a, a de-assembly line where people are just breaking down part after part after part until you get each individual cut of meat or whatever you're looking at yeah What do they do with the blood? Uh, they, they make um, this like, dish out of it. They take, they, then they slaughter the pig and they take its stomach and they clean its stomach out and they like use the blood and they, oh no, they, they combine the blood and the meat together and then they put it in these like sausage links and they use its stomach for something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that, I would don't imagine they would do it while they're still alive. I wouldn't think. I just remember, I, we were watching a little video about it and there was a pig breathing and it was laying on its side and uh, I don't know why you were watching that either. Anyway, um, that is one interesting... Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I mean, in Africa, I've seen tribal people, they'll, they'll drain blood from cows and mix it with milk for, like, a some kind of milk, blood milkshake, basically. And that's one of their main uh, modes of dietary consumption. Yeah. Why are there some slaughterhouses that, like, kill, like, food, like, beef and, like, pigs in, like, a humane way, and then some that don't? What, what would you consider humane? Well, what, which like, ones don't do it humanely, and what do they do? Like, not, like, um, torturing them or anything, just killing them as fast as you can, and then properly, like, cleaning them, and then, like, getting the meat that you need. But some, I've seen videos 
of like people who torture the animals and like hang them, hang pigs by their tails, Ooh. and like they have to watch each other die. I don't know who you're, what you're watching, but they, yeah. I don't know. It was on Facebook a lot. Like, ago. so most of I know in in the United States, there's only gosh, I want to say maybe five or six or seven like pig slaughterhouses. They're very large ones, but there's just a few of them. Um, whose phone is that? That's probably mine. Get your life together. And so, and then the cow houses, I don't think there's very, there, there's like thousands that are kind of run, going into each one of these. And most of them have to maintain a fairly humane kind of standard. Um, and that's one of the issues with the dolphins in the dolphin video is most people don't consider it to be humane. Most people don't consider it a good thing to eat dolphins, for one, but then also the practice, the killing is very, seems very inhumane in nature. It's not very quick. Um, and so, I mean, it's like people talk about bow hunting and gun hunting for deer. And, you know, some people are like, well, bow hunting's better because it's, you know, it's kind of an older art form or whatever. And I was like, you know, I think gun hunting's better because you shoot a deer with a gun, most of the time, it's going to die very quickly. With a bow, Colby, sometimes it might go a long ways, right? <laughs> Yeah, so um, maybe you don't even find it. Who knows how long it suffers or what? So um, these are things we have to, you know, ask ourselves what we're okay with um, because I think most all of us who have a heart don't want to see animals suffer even if we're willing to grow and consume those animals. Yeah. So is it true that uh, whenever the horses come to the phase when they die, they, they are sent to the knacker? Horses, they outlawed those slaughtering of horses and donkeys and stuff like a while back. I don't think they've started back either, and which created this whole other host of issues, Donovan, where when horses got old and they were decrepit, normally they would went off to a slaughterhouse and they made glue out of them and dog food and other stuff. And now they could, you can't even get rid of a horse or donkey. Like my dad's got a donkey. He can't get rid of it. Um, and so it's because nobody will buy them. Nobody wants to feed them because they use so much, eat so much grass and so much food. So unless you've got one, somebody that wants one to ride and do stuff with, um, it puts people, and a lot of people just, when they get older, they're having to shoot them and bury them. Um, and so you've got all these older horses and it's really changed the market because of that. Um, there's also a lot of horses out West that are considered to be non-native or brought in and they're you know, having an impact on the desert ecosystem where they're like wild horses running around. And instead of taking a lot of them, capturing them, and carrying them to the slaughterhouse and using them for something, they're just having to shoot them and leave them. So um, there's definitely a ripple effect when you make decisions on what you're going to do with animals. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now they, they, that's the only thing they can do. Either put them down or put them out to pasture. But they're not selling them and making food out of them anymore. Yeah. Is it true that hamburger meat used to be, uh, they, use, they used to use horse meat to make hamburger meat? Um, I think that's only at Aldi's. Yes. <laughs> um, I say that as a joke, but um, what was it? Five years ago, they found horse in some of the burger meat at Aldi's. Wow. And it was a big thing in the news. Wow. I think it was maybe in, I want to say maybe it was in Europe where this happened, but um, they were, you people on the internet can go look this up on the Google, I'm sure. Uh, they were, there was horse meat in, in the hamburger meat. It's so funny, you go to like Australia, like we were in Australia and the, uh, I went to the grocery store and I was looking around and they sell like ground uh, kangaroo. I mean, like you can go in there and get kangaroo. They call it, they call it mince meat because it's like you mince it up or whatever. But I mean, what? Um, I don't think we had any because we didn't have anywhere to cook it. No. But I mean, it's you've got to wrap your head around. Okay, we think kangaroos are cute and cuddly and stuff. But if you're driving around, like we didn't see a kangaroo for probably five or six days, and I was like, where are all these kangaroos in Australia? We drove over this, you remember I told you about the rain shadow effect? There was a, like, we were close to the coast, drive over the mountain, it starts getting dry. Yeah. There's a dead kangaroo on the side of the road. Oh. So my wife and I get out, we take a picture, because I'm like, I haven't seen one for five days, I might not see another one. And then, um, then after that, we just kept seeing them, and we spent the night in this hotel, and we're like, where, is there a good place to go see some kangaroos around here? And she's like, go to the golf course. So the next morning, this little town probably wasn't as 
big as um what uh like somewhere like I mean like Moundville basically. It was a small town, had a little golf course there, and we went out there early in the morning, like when the sun came up, and there were probably three hundred kangaroos running mm -hmm. around that golf course, eating, playing, fighting, all this other kind of stuff. But kangaroos there, I mean, it's it's pretty much like white-tailed deer here. I mean, they're everywhere. They're on, they're run over on the side of the road all the time. Um, and so it's just, I mean, they may look at white-tailed deer and think, oh, those are cute and cuddly. Why are people killing them and eating them? So culturally, you have to try to understand, empathize with people a little bit when we're thinking about other foods. Yeah. I saw this video of this um, girl, and she dressed up as a kangaroo in like a kangaroo onesie, and then there's a baby kangaroo. And she like acted like she's hopping and then it jumped in her pouch. That sounds super cute. We actually saw like some of those kangaroo babies. Um, one of them I remember was so big, it jumped in its mother's pouch, turned its head around and its feet couldn't get in. So its feet and its head was hanging out of the pouch. It was so big. Um, and then some of them, like we saw some males, like they were fighting where like you see them kicking and I've got some video where they're kicking each other as hard as they can. Um, so... There's a lot of kangaroos. You just had, and we saw some out in the wild. We went hiking in some places and would see some, but they were. It was just kind of like a safe place where they knew nobody was going to mess with them on the um, um, golf course. Yeah. Have you ever seen like a monkey just out on thing? Yes, we went to Costa Rica. There were monkeys all over the place. What, what um, I think capuchin, the one the white face kind of small ones. You know, there's some monkeys running wild down in Florida in one of the state parks, but they carry this like super deadly strain of herpes. So you got, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So you got to, um, you'll see some monkeys in the wild. You can go there, but just uh, be careful. Oh